More than 2,000 years ago, the first recorded history told how these Greek oarsmen set out to fight a sea battle against the mighty Persian fleet. Xerxes, the Persian king, had trapped Themistocles and his Greek fleet in the Bay of Salamis. Their decisive battle would prove to be one of the great turning points in history. In October 485 BC, Crown Prince Xerxes of Persia received the news that his father, King Darius, had died. According to Persian tradition, the king was chosen by God. Since no mere human could crown him, Prince Xerxes placed the crown on his own head and became king of the world's most powerful empire. The king ordered his architects to build a great avenue of palaces. The new Persian capital, Persepolis, was to become the most splendid city in the ancient world. From all over the empire, many thousands of his subjects came with gifts to honor Xerxes. Camels from Egypt caskets of gold from Asia Minor, bracelets from Africa, but nothing from the Athenians. Xerxes had not forgotten Persia's failure to conquer Greece when his father's fleet had been destroyed by storms and his army defeated at the Battle of Marathon. He was determined Athens should pay for this humiliation. Resistance to Persian rule was not something he would tolerate. The Persians were great warriors ruled by ambitious kings. By the 5th century BC, the Persian Empire stretched from Egypt to the Black Sea and from Asia Minor to the edges of India. Although the Persians had a strong army, they were nomadic conquerors who expanded their empire through political power rather than force. Religions and local traditions were respected, but all those he conquered bowed down to the king of kings. Even before he was king, Xerxes had put down rebellions in parts of the empire, but he had no great victories to his name. He had not added even a handful of earth or a cupful of water to his father's empire. If we crush the Athenians, we shall extend the empire of Persia that its boundaries will be God's own sky. Xerxes' obsession with avenging his father's defeat could only be satisfied when Athens had been destroyed. Within a year of becoming king, Xerxes began preparations for the invasion. From all over the empire, Xerxes recruited hundreds of thousands of men, the largest army the world had ever seen. 
There were not enough boats to carry an army of such size, so Xerxes had to move them by land. The mighty Persian fleet would follow. From Persepolis, he traveled to Susa and followed the royal road to Sardis. As his father had originally planned, Xerxes would invade Greece from the north. But first, he had to turn land into sea. It took laborers three years to dig a canal through Mount Athos. This time, Xerxes' fleet would avoid the storms that had wrecked his father's dreams. To move his vast army, Xerxes then turned sea into land. Hundreds of boats were lashed together, providing a spectacular floating bridge. Violent summer storms pounded the bridge. And eventually, it was smashed to pieces. When Xerxes heard of this, he commanded that the sea be punished with 300 strokes of the whip and the words, Xerxes the king will crush you whether you like it or not. Or so the Greeks tell the story. When the sea was calm once more and the bridges had been rebuilt, Xerxes prepared to lead his men into Europe. Persians, I have brought you together because I wish you to act bravely. If we conquer these Greeks, no one in all the world will try to withstand our arms. Such were their numbers that it took two days for the Persian army to march across the floating bridge from Asia into Europe. Then they turned towards Athens, with the Persian fleet never far away. In Athens, work was nearly finished on building a fleet of 200 newly designed warships called triremes. Built from oak, these new ships were light, fast and easy to manoeuvre. Long and streamlined, each galley was built to hold three levels of oarsmen. 170 rowers in all. The trireme would be the secret weapon of Athenian power at sea. It was Themistocles, a young ambitious politician who had persuaded the Athenians to spend the money on building the ships. Themistocles knew of Xerxes' campaign to destroy Athens. His strategy was to convert Athenian power from the spear and the shield to the rowing bench and the oar. The new fleet was finished just in time. As the final triremes were launched, word came that the Persian army had entered Greece. On hearing news of the invasion, the Athenians sent an ambassador to the oracle at Delphi to ask advice about the Persian enemy. Before making any important decisions, the Greeks would always consult the high priestess at Delphi. The Athenian ambassador climbed to the temple at the foot of Mount Parnassus to listen to the voice of the priestess wailing from beneath the ground. This was the message the gods sent to the people of Athens. Wretches! Why sit you there? Fly, fly to the ends of creation, leaving your homes. Get you gone out of the shrine. A wall of wood alone shall remain unsacked. Hearing the message of the oracle, some Athenians panicked and wanted to surrender the city at once. Themistocles chastised them for their cowardice. The oracle had spoken. Their salvation lay with the warships. These were the walls of wood, which would remain unsacked. The 
Persians sent envoys to the Greeks, demanding earth and water, tokens of submission. The northern Greek cities surrendered to the Persians. Athens, given one last chance to surrender, refused. Xerxes and his troops advanced on the city. As they marched through Greece, more and more of the country fell before them. The women and children of Athens fled to the nearby island of Salamis. The city was paralyzed by rumor and fear. Only the sick and infirm were left behind. When the Persians entered the city, they plundered the temples, took away the most sacred statues, and massacred those few citizens that remained. Xerxes watched as the city burnt to the ground. For Athena, the goddess of Athens, all seemed lost. Xerxes was triumphant. His father's defeat had been avenged. But he had still to destroy the Greek fleet. Xerxes joined his ships and sailed towards the Bay of Salamis. The Greek ships were waiting for them. With the Persian fleet approaching, the Greek commanders could not agree amongst themselves. Most wanted to move the Greek fleet away from Salamis to avoid a battle with the Persians, whom, they realized with horror, outnumbered them by three to one. But Themistocles was determined to stay and fight. If we fight in a narrow sea with few ships against many, we shall gain a great victory. For to fight in a narrow space is favorable to us, in an open sea to them. The whole fortune of the war depends on our ships. His determination persuaded the other Greek commanders that their only chance of victory was to fight the approaching Persians in the narrows. As the other Greek ships prepared for battle, Themistocles sent his most trusted slave to Xerxes' camp with a message for the Persian king. He told him that the Greeks were about to flee. When the slave returned, he reported that Xerxes had fallen for the trick and had ordered his captains to spend the night blocking all the escape routes. Under cover of darkness, the Persians took up their positions. While the Greeks slept soundly, the Persian crews spent the whole night at their oars. Confident of victory, Xerxes climbed a hill to find a vantage point from which he could watch the battle. By morning, the Persian ships were in place. Some blocked the western strait, the rest packed the narrow waters of Salamis Bay. They waited for movement from the Greek fleet, but none came. Xerxes asked each of his commanders for advice. All but one told him to attack. The one dissenting voice came from the only woman commander, Queen Artemisia, a Greek now fighting with the Persians. O oh, king, spare your ships and do not risk a battle. For these Greeks are much superior to you in seamanship. Are you not already master of Athens, for which you undertook this expedition? But Xerxes ignored her advice. The Greeks waited patiently for the wind to turn to their advantage. Meanwhile, fresh after a night's rest, they prepared for battle.
wind was now blowing south, pushing the Persian boats ever closer to Themistocles. The Greek ships started to move. The Persians, exhausted after patrolling all night, realized their mistake. The Greeks, far from trying to flee, were about to attack. The young men of Greece were fighting for the very existence of their country. Every trireme, 170 highly trained oarsmen pulled in unison, like a powerful engine. To frighten the enemy, the beaks of the boats were painted like faces. On the shores, Athenian spectators cheered. But at first, it seemed as though the Persians had the advantage. The battle began when a Greek ship rammed a Persian, smashing its stern and deck and spilling sailors into the sea. The Persian ships became increasingly ensnared in the narrows. The more manoeuvrable Greek ships wrought havoc upon them. In the midst of the battle, Queen Artemisia's ship seemed doomed. She was closely pursued by an Athenian trireme. Surrounded on all sides, she panicked. She bore down on another Persian ship. Seeing no alternative, she rammed and sank it. Stranded Persian ships with their exhausted crews were setting targets. It was just as Themistocles had planned. There were now so many ships in the narrows that it was almost impossible to tell Persian from Greek. The Persian king watched while his fleet was ensnared like fish in a net. Hearing that Artemisia's ship was the first Persian to ram another that day, Xerxes exclaimed, My men have become women, and my women men. The Greeks offered a prize to whoever captured Artemisia alive, but the queen escaped. She was one of the lucky few. By the end of the day, over 200 Persian ships were sunk. The Greeks lost just 40. Many men were lost on both sides, among them Xerxes' brother. Xerxes returned to Asia, leaving his army to carry on the fight. But he knew that without the command of the sea, he would never control Greece. The Persian forces were beaten again the following year at the Battle of Plataea. This double defeat was a great blow to them. Xerxes finally reached Persia, followed by the remnants of his army. His vast empire, although still intact, would not include Greece. While Xerxes was still king of kings, Themistocles was not so lucky. Athens did not reward him for the victory at Salamis. In a city based on the principles of democracy, 
His arrogance had made him powerful enemies. The citizens gathered to cast their votes and decide his future. If more than 6,000 named Themistocles, he would be exiled from Athens for 10 years. The votes were counted. Themistocles was forced to leave the city at once. There was nowhere in Greece for him to go. In desperation, he traveled to Persia and ironically turned for help to his old enemy, Xerxes. Some say that Themistocles met King Xerxes himself. More likely, it was the king's son, Artaxerxes, who received him. I am the Athenian who has done you the most harm and the most good. If you destroy me, you will be destroying an enemy of the Greeks. These words served him well, and he would spend his remaining days at the Persian court. The Greek victory at the Battle of Salamis in 480 BC was a great turning point for Greece and for Western civilization. The birth of the classical age was also the beginning of written history. Salamis was the first battle to be accurately recorded by a historian. Recognized as the father of history, Herodotus centered his work on the Persian invasion of Greece and the Battle of Salamis. I, Herodotus of Halicarnassus, publish this research to preserve the memories of the great and wonderful actions of the Greeks and the barbarians. After their victory at Salamis, the Athenians felt a new self-confidence. But the greatest achievements of classical Greece were yet to come. Without the turning point of Salamis, there would have been no Athenian League, no Athenian Empire, no center of the arts, no Parthenon, no Golden Age. High culture flourished in 5th and 4th century Athens. Aristotle and Plato produced their greatest works. This was the age of Greek theater, of Greek philosophy, of classical architecture and sculpture, the very foundations of our modern culture. Thank you.